Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to call this committee meeting to order as vice chair of the Public Health, Environment, Civil Rights, and Engagement Committee. Um, chair Cunningham isn't feeling well today, and so I will be running the meeting in his place. This is our regular meeting, October 7th, um, here in City Hall. Um, I'm joined by uh, the rest of the committee, uh, Council Vice President Jenkins, Council Members Cano, Schrader, and Johnson. Um, we have a large consent agenda and then one discussion item. We have 10 items on consent and I want to call your attention to uh, corrected staff reports uh, for items four and six that are before you. I've been assured by the clerk that these aren't significant changes, that they're mostly technical changes in nature. Um, there's some strike through language on one and then I think there's an, some other corrections just in terms of the reference numbers from funding sources on the other. I'll go through the consent items and folks can look at those and if you want to pull anything off, we can have more discussion. First item is confirming the mayoral appointment of Haley Norman to the Community Environmental Advisory Commission. Uh, second item is authorizing a grant application to the Minnesota Department of Health, uh, the amount of up to $400,000. This is for targeted opioid treatment prevention and recovering services. Third item is authorizing a submittal of a grant to the Robert Woods Foundation for a cross-sector innovation initiative. This is in the amount of up to $150,000. Fourth item is accepting a grant from the Minnesota Department of Health for over $10,000. Um, this is for the Safer Sex Intervention Project. Fifth item is accepting a grant from the Robert Wood Foundation for $20,000 for uh, community collaborative learning. Sixth item, is authorizing a contract with We All Got Sports and More uh, for the 2019 Blueprint Approved Institute for Youth Violence Prevention. The seventh item is authorizing a mutual confidentiality, uh, confidentiality agreement with TSI Incorporated to test the newest models of our air quality um, testing units. The eighth item is authorizing an increase in a contract uh, this is for um, proactive labor standards outreach and, and vulnerable worker liaison services from Satool. The ninth item is setting a public hearing for the carry out bags and retail establishments bring your own bag ordinance. We'll, we're setting that hearing if this is approved for November 18th. The tenth item is referring to staff subject matter of an ordinance introduction um, on our environmental program fees. This was introduced at the uh, council last meeting. Those are the 10 items with some of the background information. Anybody want to pull anything off for discussion? Seeing none then, I will move the consent agenda. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed, say no. That motion carries. Now that brings us to our one discussion item. And this is the uh, annual report of our uh, Clean Energy Partnership and also um, an Energy Squad program update. Welcome. Thank you, Vice Chair Gordon, Council Members. Thank you for having us here today. My name is Luke Hollenkamp. I'm in the Sustainability Division here at the City of Minneapolis. And for this presentation, I'm joined by my counterparts at the Utilities via the Clean Energy Partnership, Bridget Doctor from Excel Energy and Emma Shoppy from Centerpoint Energy. And they'll be joining me uh, to present on some of the slides in a little bit and will introduce themselves a little bit further at that time. First, a reminder of what the Clean Energy Partnership is. It's a partnership between the City of Minneapolis, Excel, and Centerpoint Energy that works to support the achievement of the city's climate and energy goals. I'm here reporting today with my colleagues on the 2018 annual report, which is providing updates on progress uh, toward the city's quantifiable climate and energy goals, as well as actions that have been taken by the partnership uh, toward these goals. At the beginning of the 2018 annual report, uh, we show seven key metrics which align with the climate and energy goals of the city. And I will get into these uh, one by one in detail in a few moments. But broadly, uh, what we see is that there, of these seven key metrics, two of them are on track, as indicated by Green here. And those two are uh, regards to greenhouse gas emission reductions in the municipal operations, as well as renewable electricity in municipal operations. Uh, three of them, as indicated in red, are currently not on track. These are greenhouse gas emission reductions community-wide, 
energy reductions in the commercial and industrial sector, and renewable electricity from local sources or directly purchased. And then there are two metrics shown in yellow here that are unknown if on track. And these two are energy's reduction in the residential sector and renewable electricity uh, consumption community-wide. So for the first metric, this measure is greenhouse gas emission reductions community-wide. As a reminder, the city has established in the Climate Action Plan goals of a 30% reduction of emissions by 2025 and an 80% reduction by 2050. Here we see that greenhouse gas emissions are down 17% in 2018 compared to 2006 baseline. And what this chart shows you is the reductions year over year compared to that 2006 baseline, which on the far left is set at zero. So the dots, the blue dots here, are the actual annual reductions each year. The red line is a trajectory that is required to hit the 2025 and 2050 reduction goals. And then that dashed black line at the bottom represents the 30% reduction needed to achieve the 2025 goal. And you'll see a sim similar format for the other metrics that we examine. I will say in um, 2018, GHG emissions that are down 17% have dropped largely due to increasingly clean grid electricity from Excel Energy. And that has what has led to most of the reductions year over year that you see on this graph. 2018 also um, represents a year where, where now natural gas is the largest emissions source, as shown in this graph in, um, in gray. It is 40% of overall GHG emissions, followed by electricity, which is 33% of overall emissions, and on-road transportation, which is 24% of emissions. There was an uptick in emissions in 2018. This was due in part to increased <laughs> natural gas use in the commercial and industrial sector, as well as 2018 featured months that were colder than our 2006 baseline, resulting in more heating for buildings. Um, it also was noteworthy, and you'll see our commercial industrial s sector metric later on, the natural gas emissions in that sector, commercial industrial, have increased 26% since 2009. That was a year with a comparable winter to the 2018 winter months. And that the commercial industrial sector now represents 62% of the natural gas consumed in Minneapolis. And that shows the critical importance of uh, emissions reductions in this area. When we look towards our 2025 and our 2050 goals, um, we see that um, there are multiple pathways to getting there. In particular, in 2025, we need to have emissions for all of those sectors I previously mentioned, plus our other emission sectors, which are wastewater and water um, and waste. We need all of the emissions from the sectors to be under 3.6 million metric tons. To get an idea if we are on track to achieve that, um, we've created some trend forecasting here. What you see on the left side of your screen are individual dots, which represent the actual GHG emissions from the electricity and natural gas sector um, in previous years. And then on the right side of the screen, you see lines that represent different scenarios for emissions um, forecasting. Natural gas emissions overall are increasing across um, all, excuse me, across commercial, industrial, and residential sectors. That's why you see natural gas projection increasing over time here. And on the electricity side, not only are we seeing reductions in electricity consumption overall, we're also seeing reductions in emissions factors from electricity, which has led to that historic decline as well as then you can see a forecasted declines via Excel's current approved IRP, their carbon free by 2050 vision, and then the city's own 100% renewable electricity goal. So notable to the 2025 goal, which is about 3.6 million metric tons, is that with, the, um, with Excel's current IRP scenario, we will just barely miss hitting our 30% reduction goal overall. However, if the city were to achieve its 100% renewable electricity goal, um, that scenario would show that the city could hit its overall emissions goal of 30% reduction by 2025. Then looking out further into the future, in 2050, we would need all five sectors to be under 1 million metric tons of CO2. Um, as you can see here, natural gas alone would be nearly 2 million metric tons according to this scenario. So because of that, we would not be close to achieving our 2050 goal. Um, this is one of the underlying trends, and this forecasting helps us um, 
look towards where we need to spend most of our time and I think the partnership as well as city policies and priorities going forward to hit this goal and to put this greenhouse gas emissions reduction metric back on target. Another metric we have is greenhouse gas emissions reductions in the municipal operations sector. This is a reduction goal of 1.5% annually. Um, since our 2008 baseline, there's been a 44% reduction in emissions, a very substantial reduction in emissions. Um, this far exceeds, as you can see here, the 1.5% annual reduction goal. And the, um, the emissions, as shown here in this graph, primarily have historically come in our municipal operations from electricity, shown in blue. Um, so one of, uh, or well, in fact, the most important element that has helped us achieve our reduction in municipal operation emissions has been that reduction in electricity emissions. That's been primarily a result of, again, a reduced carbon intensity of electricity provided on the electric grid, as well as the city now has substantial uh, subscriptions and continuous solar garden programs, as well as Excel's Renewable Connect program. Also, the city's municipal operations have seen uh, about a 10 percent decrease in energy consumption overall since 2018, and that's largely due to using less electricity as well as using um, less vehicle fuel. I think we have a question on the side. Councilman Schrader. So, for one, I just had a quick question. You mentioned community solar gardens. Could you mm -hmm. just talk, is that the city signing up or what's, mm -hmm. can you go in a little more mm -hmm. depth on that? Yep, Fisher Gordon, Council Member Schrader. Uh, that, so this metric is for municipal operations. So that is for the city being a participant, the city operations, municipal operations, city enterprise, being a participant in community solar gardens. Community solar gardens for the entire community as a goal, that's included in one of our metrics later on. Thanks, I, I only mention it just because we're doing, we've got one that's a green and one that's a red and we're able to get to that goal because of the use of that. So I feel like mm -hmm. Community Solar Gardens, I hope, is one of the recommendations. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Emma Shapi, to uh, go through the next few metrics. Good afternoon, my name is Emma Shapi. I'm the Local Energy Policy Manager with Centerpoint Energy and Luke's staff counterpart on the Clean Energy Partnership. It's great to have you here. Thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. So metric three measures progress towards the Climate Action Plan goal to achieve a 15% reduction in residential energy use by 2025. In 2018, energy use was 6% above the baseline. The blue line shows year-to-year -year variations in energy consumption, which closely aligns with weather trends. So if you're looking at the years 2014 and 2018, those were both above average in cold weather years, and those contributed to increased heating demand and energy use in the residential sector. However, um, because of these fluctuations in energy use tied to weather, it is not clear if this metric is on the necessary trajectory or that red dotted line to achieve the Climate Action Plan goal. But we do know that utility and city programs are having a dem demonstrated impact on reducing emissions despite growth in residential customers for both electricity and natural gas in the city. So diving a little bit deeper into the residential sector, I think most of you are familiar with Centerpoint and Excel's Home Energy Squad program, which helps customers understand and access energy efficiency opportunities within their home. The map compares the distribution of Home Energy Squad visits in Minneapolis in 2017 on the left and 2018 on the right. In 2018, we saw a dramatic 40% increase in Home Energy Squad visits across the city, which can be attributed to the city paying the customer copay for over 300 visits. We see that the increased visits also occurred through within the green zones. The next slide shows the distribution of Minneapolis residents that took advantage of Centerpoint Energy rebates for residential air sealing and insulation projects. Between 2017 and 2018, participation increased 7%. 
and you'll see that participation was lower in the green zones than compared to other parts in the city for both 2017 and 2018. This is in part due to insulation services offered at no cost for income qualified customers through other programs, not the rebate program. Um, but we wanna keep an eye on this program and the maps in the future uh, because of the increased home energy squad visits and other efforts to increase insulation and air sealing throughout the city. We are looking to see an increase in participation in this program. Could I just ask a question? Sure. Um, do we know, um, does anybody know the results of the energy squad visits in terms of air sealing and insulation is recommended for you? Because I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not assuming that it wasn't um, maybe recommended, but I'd like to make sure. Right. I, I think that's something we could look up. It's not something we included in the annual report but we can tell how many visits were recommended air sealing and insulation. Generally, I think it's, do you know? Sorry, Becky, put you on the spot. Territory-wide, it's probably about 70%, so Minneapolis, I would think, would be higher. Yeah, so my, and my assumption would, in the green zones, for example, there'd be a great and dramatic need, and the uh, energy squad mm -hmm. visits would show that. Yes. So there might be something we can do to encourage people to take advantage of the programs. Um, Absolutely. And, um, eventually, maybe we'll get to the point where we'll do energy squad visits and there'll be no need for sealing and insulation because right. we've done everybody, but right. I'm pretty sure we have a long, long way to go and we're behind on our record. So We do. We gotta figure those. It's great that we got more people interested in getting the visit. Um, now we need to get them interested in taking action. Absolutely. So metric four measures progress toward the climate action plan goal to achieve a 20% reduction in the commercial industrial energy use sector by 2025. In 2018, energy use was 6% above the baseline and is not on track to meet the goal. Like the residential sector, the commercial industrial sector saw usage, which is the blue line, align closely with weather trends, though to a slightly lesser degree. Economic activity combined with the low cost of natural gas and increased number of customers in commercial customers in Minneapolis has contributed to increased emissions in this sector. And diving deeper into efforts helping businesses save energy, Centerpoint Energy delivered over a thousand rebates worth over $1.2 million, and Excel Energy delivered over 2,000 rebates valued at close to $8 million to businesses that demonstrated a quantifiable energy savings. Notably, the joint utility offered energy design assistance program, which is available for new construction projects, uh, more than doubled in, in participation in 2018 compared to 2017. And Excel delivered a $225,000 rebate to a single customer that saved over 1.5 million kilowatt hours. In comparing Minneapolis commercial customer participation against CenterPoint's overall program participation, we saw that Minneapolis customers were well represented among rebate receivers for heating and water heating rebates, but underrepresented it represented in programs that help customers analyze their energy use and improve building and process efficiency. And of no, only 14 Minneapolis commercial industrial customers achieved energy savings from our natural gas energy analysis program, which is comparable to the home energy squad visit on the commercial side. So this represented only 6% of our participants in that program. And I'll hand it back over to Luke. Next, we'll shift to renewable electricity goals that the city has established. And metric number five is renewable electricity uh, community-wide, of which we have a goal uh, recently passed by the city for 100% renewable electricity by 2030. Uh, 2018 shows that we are at 26% renewable electricity. 
And uh, this percentage is generally increasing over time, as you can see here, although there are some, um, uh, some ups and downs in the data, and that's generally attributable to subscription fluctuations in Excel's, Excel Energy's green tariff programs, such as wind source or renewable connect, um, as well as uh, fluctuations in the portion of Excel Energy's generation source that is renewable and utilized during that particular year. We're at this time unable to say if this metric is on track. Um, that's without a few more years of data. Uh, one of the reasons is that uh, the goals were only just recently established in 2018, um, so we don't yet have a full year of data um, under which this goal has actually been present. And we are just beginning to roll out some of the strategies um, at the city-wide level for um, increasing renewable electricity. So I. As, I believe in 2019 and 2020, we'll get a much better idea of if we're starting to bend the curve, so to speak, on uh, this metric and having it increase beyond what's kind of its business as usual increase here. Now, this, this metric is using what we're calling an action-based methodology. Um, this is a reference to measuring the decisions and deeds by parties within the city. So the parties within the city that contribute to that 26% renewable electricity, those would include Excel Energy via their standard electricity mix, the city's municipal operations, as we've mentioned, participating in things like community solar garden programs and installing our own renewable electricity, um, as well as residential, commercial, and industrial electric account holders within the city that are making decisions uh, for their own accounts. Uh, I should mention that this methodology does not completely align with renewable um, energy certificates, ownerships. So this is based on the actions, based on, um, the, again, the deeds that are um, uh, that are undertaken by members within our community. So what does what does that actually mean? That it does not align with the um, renewable energy mm -hmm. certificate mm -hmm. ownership. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that our good deeds could be allowing someone else out there to do bad deeds? Renewable electricity is a very, uh, and renewable electricity certificates are, are very complicated because they don't necessarily accrue to someone who has made the decision to create that renewable resource. Um, often it's based on findings of the Public Utilities Commission or um, uh, proposals by Excel Energy and uh, via their tariff programs. So what we've attempted to do here via this calculation is come up with an, an adjusted mix so that we take into account only the actions um, that are attributable to city of Minneapolis residents, businesses, industrial account holders, and not those decisions be made by our neighbors in St. Paul or other parts of Excel territory. So what that means is we come up with an adjusted grid factor that Excel, um, that, I, that Excel produces, and this grid factor says we are not going to take credit again for a community solar garden subscription that a household in St. Paul subscribed to. We are only we are going to strip out all of those kind of non-Minneapolis factors and come up with just a, an adjusted grid mix, which represents what Excel kind of the entity has created. And then we are going to add on top of that what we're calling the local actions here. So that is then someone in. Uh, North Minneapolis subscribing to a low-income community solar garden um, or anywhere in the city subscribing to a low-income community solar garden or a wind source subscription or installing um, uh, rooftop solar in the house via the solar rewards program. So those are actions then that are occurring within the city of Minneapolis that we want to take credit for for our community while we're then able to not take credit um, of the actions of someone in St. Paul or St. Louis Park or other mm -hmm. territories. It's complicated. This is, a, this is a little bit of a new way to be thinking about um, how to account for renewable energy. There's a lot of cities that have created now 100% renewable electricity goals. And it's an emerging science because the standard way of accounting via renewable energy credits doesn't mesh well often with um, how a community operates and takes ownership of resources and works together to create action to achieve their goals. So we've had to create a new methodology here and we're interested in talking about this with other municipalities as well. So the renewable energy certificate ownership 
has to do with renewable energy credits? Yes. Yeah, um, it's, it's a legal it's, definition. Okay. And can they and the, the credits get <coughs> sold mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. traded independently mm -hmm. of? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, for for instance, and and uh, I invite my colleague Bridget to maybe provide more context if I um, uh, if she's got any more when she comes up here. Uh, but for instance, when you subscribe to a Renewable Connect or Wind Source, let's say for your household, um, Excel Energy, um, uh, they. Those, those credits for those kilowatt hours are retired on your behalf as a resident. So essentially you own those credits. Now because of the way some other programs are set up such as community solar garden programs, those renewable energy credits in a community solar garden program are retired um, via um, Excel Energy for all rate payers across Minnesota, not for that individual who you know, purchased that um, or create the action that caused that kilowatt hour. So there's different ways of ownership, even if um, that, that don't necessarily align with who, let's say, took that action to cause that resource to come into existence. So maybe my colleagues know, and everybody else knows a lot more about this than I do, but I thought the term retired was interesting and I don't quite know what that means. And um, if you have an energy credit, can you and you own it? Can you sell it? <coughs> you can sell it as long as it's not retired. <laughs> and can you sell it to anybody? Uh, yes, you can. And if somebody buys it, does that somehow give them some ability to burn dirtier fuel or to use dirtier energy? Or what do they? Why do they want to own a credit? Mm -hmm. I will maybe defer to Bridget when she comes up here to talk a little bit more about the market of renewable energy credits. If that's okay? I will do my best. I'm not an expert. Okay. Thank you. I'll try to learn more outside of uh, <laughs> class too. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, thanks for helping clue me in a little bit more about no. it because I think it is pretty complicated and I'm a mm -hmm. little bit suspicious about the good mm -hmm. that they do or don't do. Mm -hmm. I, if you if, couldn't tell. Vice Chair Gordon, I think it is a very, very complicated uh, financial and ownership structure, um, which is um, um, very hard to give kind of a brief definition of. Um, but and I think that that is one of the limitations of re renewable um, electricity credits in this case is that it is a complicated structure that maybe is not easily understood by kind of the general population, which is one of the reasons we've selected an action-based methodology because that's easier, I think, for us to understand and also create policies around that can um, uh, that can help increase our renewable electricity number. <coughs> Moving on to renewable electricity in our municipal operations, uh, again, we have a goal, also a goal for 100% renewable electricity in our own facilities and, um, and operations. Uh, currently in 2018, we have 45% of our electricity coming from renewable sources and this is on track to meet our goal. Um, you can see here that there has been a, uh, a rather dramatic increase in recent years and this is in large part due to uh, the uh, already mentioned increase in city operations participation in community solar gardens as well as the city also has a, a sizable renewable connect subscription. Um, also what's notable is that not all of these subscriptions were active for the entire year of 2018, meaning that those full year impacts of those current subscriptions won't be made clear until 2019. So that is to say we expect another substantial increase in renewable electricity in 2019. And next I will pass it off to Bridget who will cover our last metric. Thank you, Luke. So I'm Bridget Doctor with Excel Energy. Um, Glad to have you here. Thank you very much. Uh, in response to the renewable energy credits, so my knowledge and depth is is you know about this big, and and renewable energy credits are about this big. And I would say that um, we would be more than happy to have a subject matter expert come in and explain the full depth of renewable energy credits because they are a very complicated topic. But on a very high level, 
when it comes to renewable energy credits in general, when we procure renewable resources, um, every kilowatt hour that's generated, uh, a credit is associated with that. Um, and then we keep those credits to meet the requirements of our renewable energy standard because we have renewable energy that we're procuring beyond our renewable energy standard at this point. We have excess credits. And so we do some, some selling of those credits. Um, we have, uh, I think we've talked about in the partnership, the certified renewable percentage product where we are now um, offering that generation back to our customers at no cost, where the city can claim a certain percentage of, of your energy now being certified renewable. Um, what other questions did you have, council member? So if you sell the credit, who buys them and what do they do with them? Well, they can, credits on the open market can be used for different things. Um, anyone can buy a renewable energy credit uh, they could use them to meet their own renewable energy needs. Uh, customers or anyone could use them for anything, frankly. So your question of could they be used for other, other means, yes, they could be. So if you couldn't reach your energy efficient um, goals that were set for you, you could buy uh, energy renewable credits and then the state would say, okay, you've met your goals? Or I, I want to we could not we could not do that. We have renewable energy standard goals. We could not do that as a utility. So a general you a, we need to generate them. that. So if you're if you want to generate some dirty energy, can you buy energy credits and then generate more? That's I guess what I'm wondering about. Um, what good does it do to anybody? Hypothetically, I suppose they someone could buy, do why that. Why do they want to buy them? Um, to sell them again? Some, if they're not retired, some some parties may want to do that, yes. They may want to just pro procure credits to say that they are 100% renewable. So if you have the credits, you can say you're 100% renewable, even though to a regular person on the street, they might think that you're using some non-renewable energy. Yes. Uh, thank you. Because they, they are... RECs are certified. They are certified through an agency. And so um, if we were to generate our own energy, if we held on to our credits mm -hmm. and didn't sell them, Correct. then nobody else would be able to be burning dirtier fuel or using dirtier fuel with our credits. Correct. And the RECs that we retire in on behalf of our customers, the exact same thing. Okay. They're retired, they're gone. I guess that's the gist of it that I wanted folks to know about, and especially our committee, and when we're looking at energy, the question's gonna come up if we do generate clean energy, what are we gonna do with those wrecks? And I actually think it created a little bit of a, a confusion for mm -hmm. us about using Energy Connect and what happened with that, or- um, Renewable. Renewable Renewable Connect. Connect are, those wrecks are retired on behalf of our customers. So, so those get, are retired. We get, we get to keep them yep. or whatever. Those are all yours. Rest. They're not sold. <laughs> Community solar gardens are, those wrecks are actually sold to XL Energy, and those would be what would be included in our certified renewable percentage. Thank you. I think that's. It's still a little bit confusing, all, probably, I but know to like I said. I understand it may be a policy approach, but. I, I would be more than happy to bring someone in if you would like. No, I think that's pretty good. Okay, so our next metric is metric seven. And this is the local and directly purchased renewable energy. This is a 10% reduction in electricity used by 2025. Uh, currently, the city is at 3.9% and uh, not on track. For this particular metric, <clears throat> it includes the Wind Source Program, Renewable Connect, Solar Rewards Community, and Solar Rewards. The Wind Source Program itself is a subscription wind program. Renewable Connect is a subscription uh, wind and solar combination program. Solar Rewards Communities, Community Solar Gardens, and then Solar Rewards is just a rooftop solar program. A couple of interesting points here as we look at this particular metric is um, 
the increase in 2018 over 2017 came primarily from commercial customers in both the Renewable Connect and the Community Garden Program. 3% of the participants were 89% of the subscribed energy in the Renewable Connect Program. And similarly, 3% of the participants were 78% of the subscribed energy in the uh, Solar Garden Program. So Renewable Connect increased 859% from 2017 to 2018. This was um, largely because it was a brand new program. <clears throat> and then Solar Rewards Community, 645% um, increase from year over 17 to 18 as well. And that program has continued to, to grow year over year. We have had lower participation within the green zones for both of these programs, but because of the base of the commercial um, subscriptions on this, this, I don't find this particularly surprising. Uh, one, thing, one thing to note on, um, on the community solar garden piece is we do have a renewable development fund that Excel Energy has been working with the city on through our Clean Energy Partnership Initiative. It's about a million dollars worth that's waiting to be finalized. Um, it's designated for a low-income community solar garden. It will be hosted at your city facility in Northeast Minneapolis. Um, it's just finished the uh, leasing agreement. Kim Havey has been very, very helpful in helping to push that through, and I appreciate his help with that. So our next one, we'll move into some of our work plan highlights. In early 2019, the partners coordinated to deliver benchmarking training services to building operators of multifamily buildings. These trainings incorporated best practices in multifamily energy efficiency and recommended utility resources. The partners will continue to work together to streamline and leverage resources to improve utilization of energy efficiency and renewable energy in multifamily buildings. And additionally, um, the utilities, Excel and Center Point, completed our first program evaluation of the multifamily building efficiency program. And this is a program targeted at um, building owners to get them to move in these energy efficiency improvements. <clears throat> And so we wanted to look at um, gaining some insight in how to keep them moving on. We did interviews from multifamily um, subject matter experts within the community, and interviews included um, some folks locally within the Clean Energy Partnership, and including your staff, Luke Hollenkamp here, who was very helpful, uh, Becky Olson, who you'll hear from in a moment, who's also co-chair on EVAC, works for CEE, and then Billy Weber, who is a former EVAC co-chair as well. And then um, our next one is, a small business refrigeration program. And XL Energy developed a small business refrigeration program that was targeted at corner stores, grocery stores, gas stations, and liquor stores. And this provides a walkthrough energy assessment to identify efficiency improvement opportunities and uses a combination of direct install, prescriptive, and custom improvement measures. It includes utility rebates, that are offered to lower incremental capital costs associated with energy improvement opportunities. Those rebates are then coupled with um, your green cost share program, Patrick Hanlon's program, which has been great. <clears throat> um, this segment has been historically really tough to reach. The small businesses that are impacted by this are, are ones that uh, don't have time to go out and uh, seek educational information on it. So it's really been a one, one by one um, tackling of this segment. Uh, so we've, we've um, contracted with CEE to do this work. Um, the city has contracted with CEE to do some of the work as well. And they have, CE is also doing the financial, the financing of the products as well. Um, it's, this particular program is slow and go. And we started out after the, the Department of Commerce's approval in uh, April of 2018. Uh, we had 
we had some some slow moving with a few direct installations and and a, about uh, 48 assessments. We've got about 53 right now this year. Nine of those um, nine of those are in green zones, so we're able to start tackling some of those green zones. But again, I think it's going to be slow and go, and we'll just keep tackling this segment. So the last that I will be speaking to is our um, streetlight conversion. So this- I think we have a couple questions maybe on the last item. Uh, Council Vice President. Thank you, Vice Chair Gordon. Um, I am curious, is the, um, the equipment program available for small restaurants and like convenience stores yes. or is it only I think you named liquor stores and yep small restaurants convenience stores um, liquor stores corner stores anyone who's got refrigeration okay I think one of the tough things that we're finding with this is that group um, has a really difficult time affording new equipment and they're usually buying like the second, third hand down from like what Cub Foods hands down or you know the larger grocery store chains. Mm -hmm. And w with the program and what we could offer from a utility perspective and what the Department of Commerce would approve, we can't rebate on that. And um, the city chose to follow that path too. So that's our struggle right now. Yeah, no, uh, I mean, we need to get information out about that education, it really, um, I mean, it detracts from us reaching our goals, but it also is a large cost to it is a really businesses, large cost. Um, small, particularly small businesses, to be able not only to upgrade, which is a large cost, mm -hmm. but to have this older equipment that is not um, efficient. Yep. And you think of open coolers. They're incredibly, um, yeah. it's driving up incredible their, energy. Driving costs. up their cost of right. doing business. So, right. All right. Glad to know that it's available for yes. more than just the, the few that you named earlier. Yes. Okay. Councilmember Schrader. Just want to follow up on that point. I mean, our green cost share program is, is really popular. I mean, do we, is that an undersubscribed program? Is it an oversubscribed program? Can you give us kind of some idea of? For the small, the small business refrigeration? Yes. It is undersubscribed. The, we were able to get assessments by literally walking business to business. It is getting this segment to actually take action. Find time for us to go in, do, do the walkthroughs, because they are really, really busy. Do the walkthroughs and then finding the, the money to actually do any of the okay, thank um, you. upgrades. It's tough. Okay, go ahead. Anything else? No. Okay. No. And then lastly is the LED streetlight conversion. So this spring, Excel finished converting over 24,000 Cobra head style high pressure sodium fixtures in Minneapolis to new, more efficient fixtures using LEDs. I'm sure that you probably all got a few calls about those. <laughs> Thank you for your patience with that. Uh, and I'm sure you talked to Sarah through a lot of those. The city can expect to save more than $150,000 annually on these, on their street lighting bill. There is no cost to the city for this replacement, and Excel paid uh, for the cost of the retrofit, including the removal and salvage of the old lights and installation of the new fixtures. Any questions? Councilmember Johnson has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am very happy about this and glad uh, with all of the great work that's been done around the LED conversion. I guess I just had a uh, clarifying question. I know in the mayor's proposed budget around cultural corridors, one of the uh, topics or kind of uh, investments was around LED conversion of streetlights. Do you? Those are city owned. Perfect. Yep. Thank you. You own about half and we owned about half. Yeah. And I'll follow up separately with our public works on exactly where we're at with the John works on that. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You very and much. with that, I will hand it back over to Emma. 
So Centerpoint Energy was responsible for two major efforts in the previous partnership work plan. The first was the development and launch of a data access and benchmarking tool. This enables uh, uh, property owners of multi-tenant rental properties to access their building's aggregated energy use data while protecting individual customer privacy. And this helps um, customers or residential co residents in Minneapolis comply with the city's benchmarking uh, ordinances. So this was launched at earlier this year. The second project is Centerpoint Energy's on-bill loan repayment program, which has been under development since the 2017 work plan was underway. And this is scheduled to launch uh, early 2020, and this will help customers pay for energy efficiency projects through a loan that they can pay directly on their utility bill. It's an outside lender, and Centerpoint is simply providing the convenience of customers to be able to pay their loan through their at the same time they're paying their gas utility bill. And this should be available early 2020. Councilmember Jenkins. Do we know the interest rates on those loans? Um, so CEE is the loan provider, and the interest rates I understand are in the four to six percent range. Any help from the crowd, Becky? Sorry, um, it, it's four to six is my understanding. And then is this different from the financing uh, proposal? Um, yes. So this is an out-and-out -out loan program where the um, mm -hmm. uh, pay, the bill payer um, pays, and the inclusionary financing that we talk of, or inclusive financing, is is kind of more on the meter, and who's ever paying for that energy um, actually um, is paying less per month, but mm -hmm. the savings in energy is being used to finance the improvements. That's a really thumbnail explanation, but wasn't that good? Very good. But it's a different program. From it's this. separate. Yes. Yeah. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. And finally today on the annual report, um, I'll just mention that on the city of Minneapolis side, we, um, ad we adopted recently three new ordinances, or three ordinances and amendments um, that fulfilled some of our um, obligations in the last work plan. That would obviously be the time of rent. Um, ordinance uh, that will be taking uh, effect in 2021. The truth and sale of housing uh, energy uh, addition, energy data addition, uh, that'll take effect January 15th of 2020. And then uh, multifamily benchmark energy disclosure policies have already begun to be rolled out. Also then the city of Minneapolis has uh, specifically last session, um, last legislative session, been leading a coalition of cities and others that have been advancing um, uh, advocating for stretch energy codes. Um, there would be enabling legislation that would be required for that at a statewide level. And uh, we're, gonna, we're looking to continue those efforts. Um, something that was discussed at our last Clean Energy Partnership Board meeting uh, was on this topic. And in fact, we have now um, a meeting of all the partners um, on our calendars for this Friday to um, talk about the now city's plans going into the 2020 legislative session. And uh, we look forward to hopefully getting the utilities um, on board for this effort as well. And I know at the Q4 Clean Energy Partnership Board meeting, we'll also be uh, broadly talking about each of the partners' uh, legislative agendas for uh, next year's upcoming session. So uh, before we move on to the next, uh, or I'd say the final part of our presentation, which is more specifically in home energy squad visits, um, Bridget, M and I are happy to answer any of your general questions on the annual report. Councilmember Schrader. Sure, it's uh, more of a comment than a question. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, just when the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change came out just a couple years ago and said our best efforts mm -hmm. are not enough, and then to go through and just see the metrics that we're not even meeting our modest efforts is pretty much a kick in the gut. Um, and I, but I think I do want to point out um, one thing that uh, to the rest of my um, 
committee members, because we do have a lot of the folks from the Clean Energy Partnership, so it is you know, that kind of fun party. Um, but I think for everyone else, these the differences in metrics for me are very striking. It is something that where the city um, can advance its goal, we work very hard to do that. And you, you see in the green, we're, we're working all that we can to reduce emissions to make sure we're using renewable. Um, and the red are very, like, where we need our utility partners. And it also really puts a very fine point on the difference on how we're reviewing this. From the city's point of view, we are just also really focused on environmental justice. You know, we're not just trying to reduce carbon. We're not just trying to make sure our greenhouse emissions are done. If we were doing that, we would do something like Excel's doing. You know, we would just look at the distributed utilities and make sure we can get um, that down the, to carbon zero as quick as possible. Um, but we're doing more than that. We're trying to make this a more equitable city, and we want to make every, sure everybody is able to take part in this this next kind of change that we're seeing in our society. Um, and that's where we're, we really need the utilities help. We need to see more prog programs that are helping out expansion of community solar gardens, uh, expansion of green business cross shares, um, but also just more programs like that. So everyone is able to, to reach out and get that. Cause we're, we're right now, I mean, the numbers are pretty stark. Um, and for me, that's that's pretty shocking. We need to see movement from the utilities to, to help us with things like the stretch of energy code. Um, the city is, again, on that, that point, we're doing all we can, and we're going to quickly hit the limit of what we can do in this state. Um, and that's that says something. So we, we really need the utilities to come on board um, and to work with us. Councilmember Jenkins, did you have another comment, or is that? Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Gordon. I guess I'm the I'm concerned about the metric related to residential use and what is the process, the goal of of really trying to measure that reduction and encourage those reductions. I guess. So as we mentioned before, uh, residential energy use is very closely aligned with weather trends. So when it's very cold, um, energy use increases. But we also know that the housing stock may not be as efficient as it could be to help lessen those peaks and Val the peaks and valleys in the trends. So one of the efforts that is underway in our next work plan is Centerpoint is developing a mapping tool to be able to identify where the highest energy users are within the city. And then we can work with the community and neighborhood groups in terms of developing neighborhood specific, community specific strategies to engage customers in energy efficiency programs. So that's just one effort underway to address residential energy use consumption. And it sounds like there's a, a challenge with measuring it as well. Yeah, Vice Chair Gordon, Council Vice President Jenkins. Um, absolutely, as you can see here, um, it, it's hard to discern trends from this because the data is up and down and um, one of the things we're we're recognizing is what this really indicates is how um, non-resilient our buildings are um, that if you have a house that has very low insulation your individual energy bills could drastically increase if you have a cold winter or drastically decrease if we um, have a warm winter and that puts a lot of burden on uh, residents, um, as uh, Councilmember Schreier um, talked about, um, there's a lot of uh, real equity concerns and impacts because of this. And and this isn't this variation of energy use depending on weather is something that's also seen in commercial and industrial sector. It's much more prominent in the residential sector. But so we're concerned with it from not only just an energy standpoint, but from an equity standpoint, from a housing affordability standpoint. Um, this shows um, really how a household budget can be drastically impacted depending on the type of weather we have every winter. All right, I'll just note Thank that you. 
Yeah. Um, I think there's some key things here that we are trying to work on, and we talked about a little in terms of insulation mm -hmm. and air sealing and those things, and also this, the, a, a better building code. We're also restricted by the state building mm -hmm. code, and we want to have a stretch alternative um, building code that could get us there. And I think we're also limited because the um, the only option to heat a lot of our buildings and our homes is using natural gas. Councilmember Shreed. Yeah, just a quick thing I would also say is the the cleanest energy you have is the one you don't have to burn. So the more we can insulate, the more we can be conservative about that. The, the more options we're going to have in the future. I, and and I'll just note that. Um, it's great having everybody here. I have to say that in my first years on the council, we never had uh, utility people who would come from Excel or Centerpoint and talk and work with us. And, and now we've got willing partners to um, come and meet with us regularly. Um, not always the most harmonious and non-contentious meetings either, I understand, even at the staff level, but digging into this stuff and working on it. And I actually think these metrics are really helpful. Uh, I think it's helpful for the public and maybe all all of you, but also for the council to have a few things we can concentrate on to try to measure what we're doing. And when we see a red light or, or a red circle and a green circle, it's, it's clear where we should focus some work and some energy. And I think we've landed on probably some pretty good metrics that mm -hmm. even if we're not catching everything, mm -hmm. if we're catching these, if all of these were green, we'd be headed in a great mm -hmm. direction. And of course, they're tied very clearly to our climate action mm -hmm. plan and our energy vision. So. I appreciate that. I think the report is good, and it gives us a good picture and everybody a good picture about how how, how well we're doing in terms of the partnership and where we need to do some mm -hmm. some additional work. Mm -hmm. And with that, I think now we sh should uh, go mm -hmm. on to how we're doing with mm -hmm. our Energy Squad activity mm -hmm. in Minneapolis. Yes. Uh, Vice Chair, I'd like to introduce uh, Rebecca Olson. Um, she's the Director of Residential Programs for Center for Energy and Environment, and she's here to uh, speak um, an observance of a uh, staff direction that uh, was issued uh, during the adoption of the residential energy disclosure uh, policies. And that staff direction in part asked for updates on home energy squad, squad participation, wait times, and efforts at reducing them, and current and future efforts at workforce diversification. Um, so, it's all yours. Hi, Vice Hi. Chair Gordon, Council Members, thanks for letting me come and talk to you about where we're at with Home Energy Squad in Minneapolis. Um, we do have um, some updates on where we're at with the demand and how we've responded, but we also have some really, um, I think, exciting uh, things to highlight from this past year, too. Um, so just a little bit of background about um, what happened last year? <laughs> we had a crazy year. Um, on the on the upside, uh, the franchise fee enabled programming and funds went to buy down customer copays of the Home Energy Squad visits, down to zero for qualifying Minneapolis residents. Um, additionally, the marketing on that uh, was really effective. And at the same time, franchise fees went to buy down interest rates on loan products for Minneapolis residents as well. And so that loan product required a Home Energy Squad visit so that we could get them on the right path um, to, to achieving um, the most cost-effective measures. Um, so that created a huge influx in Minneapolis. Um, across the service territory, though, we also had a really bad year for ice dams. Probably all of us are aware of that. Um, uh, and many of the energy efficiency strategies that we are recommending to customers help solve ice dam issues. And people, very thankfully, are understanding that. That's, that's a huge win, I think. Um, but because of that, we had also some interest um, to, to help people mitigate that for subsequent years. Um, and then in January and February, we had very cold um, times. You know, we had the polar vortex. People were being, you know, really cold, having high bills. Um, so that also always brings on a lot of Home Energy Squad visit uh, requests. Um, so all of that led to about one year's worth of demand in three months. So it took us by surprise. Um, we, uh, at times, we're scheduled out about six or seven months, which is the furthest we've ever been scheduled in 10 years of running this program. Um, so we, we responded um, in a couple ways. Um, specifically, we just needed to have staff to respond to this. Um, so we hired 18 additional staff in the last year. Uh, we increased our field staff capacity by 70%, uh, which was a huge undertaking. Um, that also included two additional training positions so that we could not only get 
the people in the door, but also train them really well so we can continue to have a um, high level of customer service and quality of um, data and reporting. Um, and then we also needed Excel and CenterPoint to commit to increasing budget so that we could actually do this and, and ramp up the program. Um, so they agreed to do that and, and are agreeing to do that um, in the future. Um, and I'm happy to say that we are now back to a normal lead time about four to six weeks with some customers able to get in faster um, depending on their flexibility and the visit type. Um, so that's where we're at today. I did want to give just a picture of how we've grown in Minneapolis the last three years. Um, so in 2018 was when the first uh, visit buy downs came in and that I think that started in probably late J July early August um, so that contributed to about 40 percent increase in 2018 and then in 2019 um, including scheduled visits and our anticipated um, visits that are not scheduled yet that we have room on the calendar for we're interesting about 1874 visits just in the city of Minneapolis a 200 percent increase that's huge in three years um, and I also wanted to give context of how many customers we serve in Minneapolis versus the rest of the service territory. In Centerpoint Energy Gas Service ter Territory, about 40% of our customers are in Minneapolis. Um, and then in all of the service territory, so that includes Centerpoint Gas customers and Excel Gas customers, um, kind of you can think about it, East Metro, West Metro, and a few other scattered cities in, in the state, about 25% of those customers are Minneapolis residents. So that's by far the largest segment of customers that we have. Um, CE also looked at, um, with this influx of staff, 18 staff is a lot of people to hire quickly, um, but we also wanted to see if there was a way that we could increase our diversity at the same time. Um, so we worked with our HR uh, department to do a few things. One is that we hired a dedicated HR staff that was um, trained in hiring diverse populations. We dedicated her solely to um, recruitment for HES staff. Um, we revised our field staff job descriptions to be more accessible um, and attractive to attractive to diverse candidates. Um, we partner with several community organizations for recruitment um, and uh, worked with them on you know, showing them the job description, seeing if they had any um, feedback. We also attended one to two recruitment events um, per month with those organizations uh, to try and do face-to-face -face recruitment. And then we translated our recruitment materials as well. Um, and we, in the last nine months, have increased our CE staff racial diversity by 3%. So that's the end of my presentation. Do you guys have any questions? I don't see any questions. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Does anybody have any final comments or questions? Seeing none, I will move to receive and file both of those uh, reports. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. That motion carries. And seeing no further business, we are adjourned. Thank you.